and start over. <laughs> so welcome back. Actually, I'm gonna, I don't know where to look. Anyway, welcome back. I am so excited to talk to you again about Gateway. Uh, so this idea came to me because on Sunday, January 7th, it was announced that the UAE, am I still alive? <clears throat> All right. The UAE is contributing the airlock for the Gateway. And in this is a contribution, right? So the UAE, the United Arab Emirates, it is a participant of the Artemis Accords, one of the, the original signatories. And in exchange for contributing the airlock, they are going to have an astronaut participate in the Artemis missions. Uh, don't know what that's going to look like yet. We don't know whether that's going to be a cis lunar mission, a lunar surface mission, a gateway mission. Don't know. But my initial thought was, one, fantastic that the UAE is involved. I'm glad that they are getting more involved in the Artemis missions. And two, I don't really know whether or not uh, to be excited about this overall, because it's a shame it wasn't something more substantial. It's a shame that it went to Gateway and not to an Artemis lunar base. Because if you think about it, Gateway is a temporary program. Gateway is... Um, Something that's, uh, it's, a, it's a mini space station or a space outpost, if you prefer, and it's going to go in a certain orbit around the moon, and it has a certain lifetime. Whereas, if you think about longer term, what is NASA trying to build on the moon? It is trying to build something sustainable, right? That is what the key word is that is thrown around a lot, and it means different things to different people. But we can all understand that a temporary outpost on the surface, uh, in orbit around the moon, which it, Gateway is only expected to be habitable because of budgets and uh, resources, only one month out of a year. So a very not habited you know, habitation module and all these other elements that are going to be part of Gateway that suck up a lot of money and a lot of resources in terms of energy, publicity, uh, geopolitical, capital, uh, it, all of that is going to Gateway and it's not going to the sustainability of the Artemis program. As of right now, we do not have any firm details as to what Artemis Base Camp might look like. In fact, in 2023, NASA officials were talking about multiple camps instead of one camp. Why limit us, right? Uh, unfortunately, because this the, this is sort of a nebulous idea, this, this base camp idea, um, it's unlikely to be funded and unlikely to happen anytime soon. I do believe that eventually there will be an Artemis base camp. I do believe that eventually there will be a permanent habitation on the surface of the moon. But because NASA does not have the funds and does not have the focus to actually create it at this time, yes, they've got the landing missions, but having something sustainable, that's just not on NASA's you know, timeline as a concrete thing. Same thing with Mars, right? For a long time now, um, I think since pretty much 1969, I, I recall uh, a newspaper article that I read the day after the Apollo 11 moon landing, where the newspaper was saying, fantastic, we landed on the moon, not in these words, but <laughs> the gist was, we landed on the moon, the next step is to go to Mars. So 1969, we've been talking about moon to Mars. This is not a new concept, but because it's always a nebulous idea going to Mars, there's no concrete, like, this is humans to Mars, of course, there's no concrete ideas, plans, missions, funding for sending humans to Mars. So it's always in the future, in some unknown future. And that is how I feel about Artemis Base Camp, because NASA has ignored it, because NASA has limited funding. This would not be an issue. I would have no problem with Gateway if funding was unlimited. I, in my life, tend to have an abundance mindset, but when it comes to budgets, federal government budgets, NASA's budget, there really is uh, just one pie that does not really increase all that much. And it is, um, you know, it, it is divvied amongst all the different programs that NASA is responsible for. And it, it's a zero sum game, right? If NASA is putting resources, that is money, personnel, uh, you know, diplomatic energy into Gateway, then it is not doing that for Artemis Base Camp. It's not doing that for the sustainability of the Artemis mission, the Artemis program. And so it's not new that there are international partnerships. Let me put that out there. So to give you a bit of background, I'm going to pull up my notes and I'm going to have to move the live stream to do that. <laughs> so Gateway is an international partnership between, let me go down, I'm sorry 
between ESA, the European Space Agency, which is contributing the International Habitation Module, IHAB, the Canadian Space Agency, CSA, which is contributing Advanced External Robotics, think Canada Arm, uh, Japanese, uh, Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency, JAXA, which is contributing uh, capabilities for the IHAB. And so UAE is just one additional contributor to the Gateway program. But imagine that Gateway doesn't exist. Imagine that NASA is trying to get international collaboration for the Artemis program and Gateway is out of the picture. It's not a thing. Well, they're going to funnel it towards surface missions. They're not going to waste their time on these uh, orbiting missions when they can funnel all of this attention and all these partnerships to surface missions and make it, again, sustainable, which is the whole point of Artemis. It's not to go there like we did with Apollo and plant a flag and do that a few more times and then leave. Um, that's not what we want. I loved Apollo. So I, I um, was not born yet during the Apollo program. And that is what inspired me actually when I was a little kid was learning about Apollo. That's why I am so passionate that we go there to stay. We go there permanently. I do want to address the fact that NASA has chosen SpaceX's Starship as its first lunar lander, human landing system. And the idea has been proposed by mostly fans. I don't believe that any NASA official or SpaceX official has set, stated this, but in the space community, it has been proposed that maybe we can turn Starship landers, you know, HLS Starship into a permanent lunar habitation, like some kind of facility that's made up of different Starships that land that can be our base. Um, Maybe. I, I think that's a really cool idea. I would like to see that happen. But until we have firm plans and commitment from NASA and SpaceX, that's not going to happen. Um, so maybe that'll happen. And then that'd be really cool. But until I actually see some firm, solid plans with funding behind it, I'm not going to believe it. And let's talk about funding for a moment, because Gateway is not free. <laughs> Uh, Gateway, of course, costs money, and it costs. I, I did not find a total figure as to how much NASA spent on Gateway thus far. Gateway is a twenty-some year program a concept, I should say, not, not a program. But um, the Gateway concept has been around for at least two decades, and so the earliest that I can found just by you know researching really fast. I didn't like, dive into this for hours, but um, in twenty nineteen, NASA awarded. NASA was awarded by Congress. Of course, NASA gets all of its money from, from Congress. Uh, $450 million was committed to NASA for some studies having to do with Gateway. And that same year, Maxar was awarded a firm fixed price contract of $375 million to build the propulsion PPE, propulsion power and propulsion element PPE. And then Northrop Grumman was awarded $187 million to do a, a preliminary design. Uh, Maxar also got money for a preliminary design. It was less than $100 million. I don't remember the exact figure. Um, so Northrop Grumman got $187 million to complete the preliminary design for the Halo. And then um, additional funding of, there it is, $935 million, almost a billion dollars, to actually build the Halo module and to integrate it with the PPE. The Halo is the habitation module. So um, then NASA awarded in uh, NASA awarded SpaceX a contract to actually launch it because it's not enough to build it. You actually have to get it there. So NASA awarded three hundred and thirty one point eight million dollars to SpaceX to launch it on a Falcon Heavy currently scheduled for November of 2025, which realistically might slip, probably will slip to 2026. And so if you divvy all of that up, I mean, that's already a couple billion dollars spent on Gateway, and that's not counting internal NASA personnel and energy and, and design and all of the things. So to give you an idea, the White House, that is NASA, Biden administration, requested $914.2 million for Gateway for the fiscal year 2024. So almost a billion dollars in Gateway money. Um, from NASA's budget. NASA has a very finite budget. <laughs> it's always in flux. It is always debate in debate. Um, and a billion, almost a billion dollars of that NASA is setting aside for Gateway. Imagine if Gateway didn't exist. Imagine if NASA could be requesting $900 million for Artemis Base Camp instead. How much more progress would we have made, you know, just by having that funding go to something that is sustainable? There are some legitimate arguments for Gateway. I have gone back and forth about it. Um, some of the things that have been discussed with 
regards to the benefits of Gateway is that it will give us a radiation profile that we can better understand humans to Mars. Eventually humans will be going to Mars, right? And we need to understand the deep space radiation environment. And I agree, but we don't need Gateway for that. We do not need a very expensive space station or space outpost that has humans on board to understand the radiation environment. In fact, we shouldn't be putting people out there until we understand the radiation environment, right? Um, so Capstone, if you remember that little satellite that was the very, very first of the official Artemis missions, Capstone was actually put in this uh, this strange orbit around the moon to study the radiation environment. That is really cool and that is inexpensive and it is scientifically useful. And if we want to understand the radiation environment uh, going to Mars, then we need to send more probes. We don't need to send a huge, you know, habitable thing that we put in orbit around the moon to understand the radiation environment. Another argument is that it will help with lunar science. Uh, I am a lunar scientist by training. I hate this idea. <laughs> We have orbiters around the moon. Orbiters are really scientifically useful. They are scientifically, um, they have already been scientifically significant in providing us with an understanding of all of the lunar science that we can do on the surface. And that's the key, right? The orbiters contribute to the greater understanding and then we need to go to the surface it's the reason why we actually land you know these these missions to on mars right we don't just have orbiters around mars we actually send things that go and rove around and dig because surface operations are what's really going to provide us with so much more detail it's why nasa is pouring so much money into mars sample return because just having teeny little samples or or even going out to an asteroid and bringing that back at, at a great expense having a little sample of something and being able to put our hands on it and put it in scientific equipment, whether it's scientific equipment that is in situ, that is at the site, or whether it's scientific equipment here on Earth, you know, that's valuable. And so as a lunar scientist, and I can imagine any astronaut, not an astronaut, but I can imagine any astronaut would not only be orbiting the moon to do lunar science. You don't need an astronaut to be orbiting the moon lunar, doing lunar science. What you need is an astronaut there, you know, digging their, their gloved hands into the regolith and, um, you know, watching it fall in the, in the lower gravity and, and doing all the great things that we will be able to do in terms of digging and examining what the regolith is made of and understanding what we can do with that in situ resource utilization. And so I would say Gateway is actually a detriment to lunar science in that sense because Gateway is taking up a significant amount of money that could be spent either on lunar orbiters that are not human rated or on surface operations. Another thing that has been brought up, and I think this is actually one of the only legitimate reasons for Gateway, is that it is low-hanging fruit for international cooperation. And um, I meant to look up who is actually, who is the person who used that term with me yesterday, low-hanging fruit. Forgive me, I had it up on my phone, but my phone is now currently being used for something else. So, <laughs> um, I don't know, Chris Lee he is the one who used the term low-hanging fruit with me yesterday when it comes to the idea of international collaboration because we have the europeans we have the canadians we have the japanese and we have the emiratis who are now involved in this and they don't need to necessarily contribute to something that is more expensive and more complex such as uh, surface base they can do something they're already familiar with which is a space station you know we've had this fantastic international partnership for over two decades now on the international space station and that is understandable and uh, fairly well worked out um, the Russians have had complications, but the Russians are not involved in Gateway or Artemis. So it is conceivable that it is just an easier sell diplomatically to get countries to agree to a space station around the moon rather than to agree to surface operations. And I can understand that. But on the other hand, I think that the U.S. should be leaders. I think that our role here is to do something fantastic, to do something that is deemed impossible, to do something, you know, this is what NASA does. NASA is known around the world for making the impossible happen and for leading the way to do so. You know, I love the fact that there's so many countries that are involved in space, but globally, NASA is that name recognition, that brand that is known for breaking ground and for doing fantastic things that advanced humanity in space. And this is not it. Gateway is not it. Gateway is just a cop out. Gateway is a distraction, as the title of my live stream here is, because it is distracting NASA from doing the great things. 
if we gave NASA permission, if Congress and the Biden administration gave NASA the permission to do great things, landing humans on the surface of the moon, and I'm almost talking another Kennedy moment where we say, we're going to do this, and we're going to do this by X amount of time. And under the Biden administration, uh, Vice President Mike Pence did actually give us this kind of speech, but there was no oomph behind it. There was no funding behind it. There was no real push behind it. Whereas um, I think the Apollo administration, I wasn't alive then. I'm the Apollo administration. I think the Apollo era uh, was a little different. Like, again, I wasn't alive then, but I think that had much more of a, a push to, behind it. Um, and so. I feel like this is something that is a sacrifice, not a sacrifice, that's not the right word, a compromise. It is an unnecessary compromise on what NASA can accomplish and what our international partners can accomplish with our leadership. Um, so those are really the key points that I wanted to bring up. Um, Another thing I think is actually a positive, back in the day it was a positive, was the flexibility of Gateway because between administrations when the Obama administration was transitioning out and the Trump administration was transitioning in, we did not know if the Trump administration was going to keep the idea not keep, but reinstate the idea of a, uh, a moon program because the, the Obama administration had canceled Constellation that was under George W. Bush. And so with that uh, change, of, in, in, change of administration, there's always uncertainty. So flexibility was a strength and that gateway was something that we could easily say, here's something that we're creating. It is flexible for many missions. It has gone by many names. So a deep space gateway was one of the names. Uh, gateway to Mars was actually a name that was once used. So gateway has that flexibility of architecture. But in that sense, it was also, it is also a distraction because um, it's not strictly needed. We already know it's not needed for a lunar landing because it's not being built in time for the lunar landings or not being used in Artemis. It was not used in Artemis 1 and it is not being planned to use. It is not, Gateway is not being planned to be used in Artemis 2, 3, or 4. So it is not strictly needed in the architecture for Artemis. So I don't believe that is an actual strength anymore of the Gateway program. Uh, let's see. I think that's about all I wanted to cover. Yeah. Um, I'm so sorry. I don't even know if this is on live. I can't see anybody participating. No, it's not. Shit. <laughs> so sorry that the live stream did not quite work out the way I wanted it to. Thank you all for joining in that initially did join. If you would like these in your inbox, please subscribe to astrolytical.com slash subscribe for your newsletters that come in your inbox every Monday morning. And join me again next Friday. Thank you.